It is good to be here. And um, I have been blessed to have been here with my family for nearly eight years. And as you've all heard, the eight years is nearly up. At least for my wife and I, that's it. And as I look across your faces, I have lots of memories. And Tim Golly, while you're here, you may not be here the next few Sabbaths when I'm here. I've got memories of the two Tims with this Tim. Munching grapes. I think it was the first year I was here at the communion service. And I thank you for being daring to do that. But... Just to let you know, by the way, that um, I'll be replaced by Peter Howard of Mwilumba. He'll be coming down here, and from what I understand at this stage, you'll be able to have him as your sole pastor. I don't think you'll be sharing him with anyone at this stage, but things may change. More, I dare say, well, more will be said as the year closes. Coming out. I'll just ask you to just pray with me, please, if you would, Father, as we just spend time on this, what is the final warning in Revelation. Just ask for your wisdom. I just need your words and please may your thoughts in particular be able to enter even our souls unhindered so that we can dance only to your tunes. In Jesus' name. Coming out. I've got this quote on uh, Tuesday night. Until our passion for finding God is deeper than any other passion, we will arrange life according to our tastes and not God's. Did you get that? Let me read it again. Until our passion for finding God is deeper than any other passion, we will arrange life according to our tastes and not God's. I remember hearing Bob Brown, former leader of the Greens, talking about his struggle with homosexuality and about coming out. He was brought up going to the Presbyterian Sunday School. And he tried prayer. He tried counselling. He tried shock treatment. He contemplated suicide to deal with this desire within him. I do believe that the Bible is against practicing homosexuality, that it is a sin. However, I acknowledge that would have taken great courage for Bob Brown to become open with regard to his his sexuality. In those days, 1976, there was no cool factor or experimental factor back then. It would have taken guts to come out. Similarly, when God calls for those that are his, that are caught up in Babylon towards the end of time, to come out, I suspect that that would also take much courage. Are you hearing? Can you turn your Bibles, please, to Revelation 18, where we will read such an invitation. Revelation 18, the first five verses, and as per usual, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And I'm just feasting my eyes upon you. Before... (laughs) Before heading to Casino and Kyogre, where the sum total, I believe, is about 50. 
Revelation 18, starting at verse 1. After this, I saw another angel. Coco, it's good to see you, sister. Woo! You know what I'm talking about? You're totally awake? Coco formally became our sister last Sabbath afternoon. Just want to embarrass you, Coco. Not really, I just want to welcome you again. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. This, yes, is in conjunction with Revelation 17, where, God, where, where John was taken to see Babylon, who proved to be this dressed-up prostitute on this ugly-looking beast. Seven heads, ten horns, scarlet. Red judgment was pronounced upon her and that creature. And it's interesting, over time, I can just imagine the Christians saying, flee from Jerusalem. Jerusalem, who purportedly had seven hills. I can just imagine people applying that beast to Rome saying, flee from Rome, from the Roman Empire, the things of the Roman Empire, because judgment will be happening. And then when the capital of, of the Roman Empire moved from Rome to Constantinople, or what became Constantinople, who also was, which also was based upon seven hills, the same thing could have been said. Even perhaps at the beginnings of the Muslim empire. And I can just imagine the Christians, those who belonged to the church back then, saying, escape, run away. Perhaps those of the church of Rome would have said it from the Saracens. Certainly the Protestants said it of the Roman Catholics. Get out of her. And we have even said similarly. But I think this is a lot larger than that. Can I offer it as one explanation? That here we have a call which is made by God through his people to those who are his and who are caught up in false worship, a call to come out. A movement from false worship, as in Revelation 13, to creator worship, from Revelation 14, to worship God as creator. From disobedience to obedience. And it happens towards the end of time, just before the plagues. Remember the plagues last time I was here. And when I think of examples of what it is to come out from the Bible, can I remind you in particular of the prophet Jeremiah who wrote words about the fall of Babylon, chapter 50 and 51 of Jeremiah. And for God's people to leave before her destruction, before Babylon's destruction that is, and had them sent, had these words sent in a book to be read back in, in, over in Babylon. Then that book was to be tied to a stone and cast into the middle of the Euphrates. Thus Babylon would sink, never to rise again. 
You can read for yourself in Jeremiah 15, 51. Can I also remind you of Abram being called out from Ur and then from Haran? Genesis 12. What about Lot being called out with his family from? Can you finish it with me? Or for me? Sodom. Israel from Egypt in Exodus 12. What about what Jesus said to the Christians to flee from Jerusalem? When you see Jerusalem surrounded. And of course, the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 6 and Ephesians 5. For Christians to flee from the world. But when we think of the idea of coming out, from where are we, and I'll say we, from where are we to come and where are we to go to? It's all very well to say come out, but where are we to go? Babylon? Well, it didn't exist in John's day. It's been discovered it's uninhabited today, so we're dealing with a metaphor, a symbol. And from looking at chapter 17 in particular, we're dealing with a successfully seductive prostitute dressed as a high priest who had spiritual and economic sway over the nations of the world. A literal prostitute? No. But a system that has prostituted the things of God. And can I remind you and take you Back to the Tower of Babel, the Babel syndrome upon which Babylon is based, I would suggest. Genesis 11 verse 4. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, using brick and bitumen. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So God came and confused, or Balel, their language. Therefore his name was called Babel, because the Lord there, that is in the land of Shinar, just outside of Babylon, he confused the languages of all the earth. What's that about? Mankind attempting to usurp the power that exclusively belonged to heaven. To unite and to take over what is God's, and that is to control earth. To, dom to dominate the world. That only belonged to God and here is mankind doing that. You also find similarly in Revelation 16 verse 14 and of course Daniel 3 where, uh, where Nebuchadnezzar gathered the leaders of the nations at least of his empire there on the plains of China. Us. The Babel syndrome for us when we put up the church as a gateway to God, when we replace Jesus with the church and faith with politics, when we become preoccupied with institutional correctness and protection and numbers rather than with the direction of the Holy Spirit, when we live by, and, and rather than living by faith and freedom, caring for people and being completely faithful to him, that is when you and I are guilty of the same syndrome. Are you hearing me? And that happens far too often. Personally, when I am in charge of my own living, when I put myself in the centre of my decision making, my growing, my heart and my world, when I form my day around me, that is when I form my day around me, that is also the Babel syndrome. When I'm in charge. And this Babylon... This high priestess, this mistress is seductive. It is the world from which we are to flee at all times, let alone at the end. Huh. Some examples, if I may. What about the media? Getting into our minds and we become used to the high-octane entertainment, violence and sex, what it is to be on top of our game. That's what the media tries in puts into our headspace. Entertainment. I can do it. At least we try to 
be in charge of ourselves. Success. I'm a self-made man. You're a self-made woman. And we laud these people and put them in positions of influence. Even in our church. Eye-centeredness, full of consumerism and protectionism. What can I get out of Alstonville? Nah, it's boring. I'm not going. Or we try and, I, I need to protect my time and my finances rather than can I contribute regularly, even on the edge, even to the utmost, like that widow that Jesus applauded. And I know, as you know, that there are quite a few areas of ministry here in our church that are struggling while many seem to be sitting back. That is sin. So where are we to flee to? From where to where? From Babylon, as described, to where? Many of us have struggled with this. I have left the world. I have chosen Jesus. But he seems distant. No one is home. I want to remain faithful, but it is so difficult. Babylon speaks a seductive whisper or even a shrill squawk. Sometimes she does not need to speak. I just find myself doing it. It just wells up. It's so easy. But God is silent. So where do I flee to? The silence of God? Some thoughts, if I may. In those times of silences, in those periods of silence which may seem so very long, can I suggest a checklist? First of all, are there any blockages in my life? And perhaps I may need to ask, the Holy Spirit to reveal them to me because I can be as deluded as anyone else. For them to be revealed so that I can confess and repent of these blockages. For example, false excitement, the adrenaline rushes from films, novels, etc., etc. I expect God to be like that. Instant encore rush, dollar pizza or internet game or porn. God's meant to be the same. Interestingly, Jesus likens himself to bread. He doesn't liken himself to some exotic dish that gets a foodie salivating. Just ordinary bread. And how many of us find breakfast boring? Or do we go and really hype it up and today's different to tomorrow? No, we just eat breakfast. Why? Because we need to. It's all right. I could eat wheat bix for the next 50 years. You can stick to your porridge, Wilma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we don't stop eating do we false excitement we need to confess and get rid of those false excitements and enter the real and solid world where Jesus gives us the strength to deal with it not to run away from it what about false expectations that God will show himself no matter what I do I mean Isaiah Isaiah says, God had his fingers in his ears due to the sins of his people, no matter if they fast and pray for how long. The sins of injustice. Have a look for yourself, Isaiah 58 and 59. Finances. How are we paying, for those of us who employ people, how do we pay our employees? How do we pay the tax man? How do we return the tithe? And the offerings, that which is not ours. What about the sins of injustice at home? How we treat those we love? Perhaps obsessing with the real sins, inverted commas please, of our workmates or church members or leaders. Again, we need to confess and give them to him to deal with, asking for a new heart and a new mind. Perhaps we may be avoiding the silences, 
We can promote God's absence by avoiding the silences, the solitude, or by avoiding praying with others, or avoiding service. Rather than we concentrate on education, on money, on clubbing, on sex, on status, on health, and particularly my own list of grievances. I keep busy, very busy, and stay with that which is noisy or texting. So easy to be interfered, like what I was trying to do with these kids here. So easy to be distracted. The media, with people. And we wonder why God is silent. Perhaps I need to close those windows and get into the silences with my pencil and paper and seek his face continually. Perhaps God has already revealed his will to me and I have been quietly obstinate. His will that involves continual and reliable service, making a small difference in somebody's life, having the spotlight off me and onto somebody else and I don't want to go there. It's too continual, it's too... eh. Let me read an example if I can. Paul Brandt, doctor who dealt with lepers, some of you may know, talks about his most memorable visitor to Velour, India, where he directed a leprosy hospital. One day, a French friar named Pierre showed up, a homely man with a big nose, wearing a simple monk's habit and carrying a single carpet bag that contained everything he possessed. Over the next few weeks, he stayed with the brands and told them his life story. Born into a noble family, he had served in the French parliament until he became disillusioned with the slow pace of political change. After World War II, with Paris still reeling from the effects of Nazi occupation, thousands of homeless beggars lived in the streets. Pierre could not tolerate the endless debates by noblemen and politicians while so many, people, so many street people starved outside. During an unusually harsh winter, many of the Parisian Beggars froze to death. In desperation, Pierre resigned his post and became a Catholic friar to work among them. Failing to interest politicians or the community in the beggars' plight, he concluded his only recourse was to organise the beggars themselves. He taught them to do menial tasks better. Instead of sporadically collecting bottles and rags, they divided the teams to scale the city. Next, he led them to build a warehouse from discarded bricks and then start a business in which they sorted and processed vast quantities of used bottles from hotels and businesses. Finally, Pierre inspired each beggar by giving them responsibility to help another beggar poorer than himself. The project caught fire, and in a few years, an organisation called Emmaus was founded to expand Pierre's work into other countries. But now he had come to Velour, Pierre told the brands, because the organisation was facing a point of crisis. After years of this work, there were no beggars left in Paris. I must find somebody for my beggars to help, he, he, he declared. If I don't find people worse off than my beggars, this movement could turn inward. They'll become a powerful, rich organisation and the whole spiritual impact will, will be lost. They'll have no one to serve. Perhaps God has already w- showed his will to me and I don't want to go there. What about motives? Why are we seeking his face? Do I want God in my terms? Perhaps he has already revealed himself to me through creation, through the Bible, through, G- through Jesus, through someone else. I am to seek God, not happiness or misty devotional feelings. In those times of dryness, The rest of my life can come alive as I look for his face in that which is around me. I'm more tuned into everything else in case God might reveal himself through that which is around me. And perhaps I may be pursuing results from God rather than companionship with him. Think of Paul's thorn in the flesh, which he prayed about for many times, that he wanted to be removed, but it didn't happen. So Paul had to reorientate his own mind. He had to rely upon God more and the companionship he had with him. Something else. Try reading and contemplating prayerfully those stories in the Bible where various people did encounter God. With those windows closed. 
those distractions muted. Think Isaiah, Moses, Abraham, Daniel, the disciples. Try the last days of Jesus' own life and persist like that nagging widow Jesus mentioned, asking him to reveal himself after going through that checklist mentioned before. Hmm. Should I mention this? When's the last time you participated in the 24-7? What about, putting, what about me putting myself out and making that commitment to early morning prayer group? Am I nagging? Yes. But it's a bit sad when only three or four people turn up. The same three or four people. I find it a real anchoring with others that are there. You see, if we do not put ourselves out, it must not be important. If we do not prioritise, huh, God is not instant. Huh, neither is a good marriage. Apparently in the Gospels, people approach Jesus with, question, with a question 183 times. 183 times people asked Jesus a question. He answered them directly three times. So that leaves 180 questions left up in the air. He responded with either a different question, a story, or some other indirection. You see, it's been suggested that Jesus may want us to work out answers on our own, using the principles that he taught and lived. In the difficult and sometimes frustrating act of pursuing God, I am changed, and that equips me to serve. Maybe what I sense as abandonment is actually a form of empowerment. Did you get that? When I feel emba- ab- ab- abandoned by God, perhaps that is when I have been given his power to serve. Hmm. Think of the why questions. The Bible greats hardly looked back at the whys. They hardly asked that question. Rather, they looked at the present and forward to the future. So from Babylon to vacancy? No. Rather, from Babylon to Jesus. Fully, radically Jesus. Remember the 144,000? They follow Jesus as slain lamb wherever he takes them. First of all, Jesus is a person. When is the last time we have truly sought his presence? When When have we sought him with all of our being, with all of that passion? So first of all, Jesus is person. Secondly, he's slain lamb. Always the cross. Let the cross always be the basis of our following rather than my sinlessness. I will still struggle with sin. No doubt about it. Until he changes me. And, so I, I, and to be comforted by, by David's own prayer there in, Isaiah, in, in Psalms 51. Please turn your eyes away from my sin, but not from me. When I submit to him and to his love, to his blood, it makes a huge difference. So they follow a person, Jesus, a lamb that is slain, the cross, And wherever he goes, they go. And sometimes it seems that he does not give any direction. In those times, perhaps he already has. There's plenty of service areas to get involved with, to become preoccupied with. And we may even do that for about a week, and then we become disinterested, bored, too hard, whatever. Yeah, we're weaklings. We become too tired, bored, or threatened, or too afraid. Think of Jonah. Think of Peter walking in the water. Because it has become about us. 
When my life is filled with contemplation and spiritual infilling and service, both paid and volunteering, there's not much time for anything else. Believe me. You see, it takes a lot to come out. But that is the call. To come out of her, my people, lest do you participate in her sins and share in her plagues. Come out, we must. And here's the call we need to live out and to give in such a time as this. And it is something we need to pursue with passion. A passion that only comes with time, with choice, and with his implanting. Until our passion for finding God is deeper than any other passion, we will arrange life according to our taste, not God's. And I'm afraid we could well end up then with Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Let me read you. A benediction, which I found quite challenging. May God bless you with discomfort, at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor, in his name. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior 
am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Father God, we need help in our leaving. We need help in our coming out. And we also need very much help to be able to see your face, to know where we're coming to. Please give us the strength. Please give us the wisdom. Please give us the tenacity. Please give us the passion to be able to leave at the end what is the place where we try and be king to the place where Jesus is king. And we ask this in his name. Amen.